planarian is a flatworm. It has one head and one tail normally. And the amazing, the, the several amazing things about planaria, but basically they, they kind of, I think, I think planaria hold uh, the answer to pretty much every deep question of life. For one thing, they're similar to our ancestors. So they they have true symmetry. They have a true brain. They're not like earthworms. They're, you know, they're much more advanced life form. They have lots of different internal organs, but they're these little, um, they're about, you know, maybe two centimeters in, in the centimeter to two in size. They have a, brain, a head and a tail. And the first thing is planaria are immortal. So they do not age. There's no such thing as an old planarian. So that right there tells you that these theories of thermodynamic um, limitations of, on lifespan are wrong. It's not, it's not that well over time of, of everything degrades. No, planaria can keep it going for uh, probably, you know, how long have they been around? 400 million years, right? So these are the actual, so the planaria in our lab are actually in physical continuity with planaria that were here 400 million years ago. So there's planaria that have lived that long. Essentially, what does it mean? Physical continuity? Because because what they do is they split in half. The way they reproduce is they split in half. So so the planaria, the back the back end grabs the petri dish, the front end takes off, and they they rip themselves in half. But is, then, isn't in some sense we're like you are a, con a physical continuation? Yes, except that except that we go through a bottleneck of one cell, which is yeah. the egg. They do not. I mean, they can. There are certain planaria that- Got it. So right? we go through a very uh, ruthless compression yes, process yes. and they don't. Yes, like yeah. an autoencoder, you know, sort yeah. of squash down to one cell and then back out. These these guys just tear themselves in half and then each, and then, and so the other amazing thing about them is they regenerate. So you yeah. can cut them into pieces. The record is, I think, 276 or something like that by Thomas Hunt Morgan. Uh, and each piece regrows a perfect little worm. They know exactly, every piece knows exactly what's missing, what needs to happen. Uh, in fact, in fact, if you chop it in half, as it grows the other half, uh, the original, the, the original uh, tissue shrinks so that when the new tiny head shows up, they're proportional. So it keeps, it keeps perfect proportion. If you, if you starve them, they shrink. If you feed them again, they expand. They, their control, their anatomical control is, is, is just insane. Somebody cut them into over 200 yeah. pieces. Yeah. 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 Thomas Hunt Morgan did. Yeah. Hashtag science. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And maybe more. I mean, they didn't have antibiotics back then. I bet he lost some due to infection. I bet, I bet it's actually more than that. You could, I bet you could do more than that. Humans can't do that. This <laughs> well, yeah, yes. I mean, again, yeah, true, except Maybe that- Maybe you can at the embryonic level. Well, that's that's the thing, right? So so I tell, when, when I talk about this, I say, just remember that as, as amazing as it is to grow a whole planarian from a tiny fragment, half of the human population can grow a full body from one cell. Right. So, so development is really, you can look at development as a, as a, just an example of regeneration. Yeah. To think we'll talk about regenerative medicine, but there's some sense what would be like that warm in like 500 yeah. years where I, 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 I can so. just go whoosh, regrow a hand. Yep. I, with, with given time, it takes time to grow large things, but for now, yeah, I think so. I think you can probably, ex why not accelerate? Oh, biology takes its time. I'm not going to say anything is impossible, but I don't know of a way to accelerate these processes. I think it's possible. I think we are going to be regenerative, but I don't know of a way to make it fast. I could just think people from a few centuries from now would be like, well, they have to, they used to have to wait a week for the hand to regrow. It's like when the microwave was invented, yeah, you can, you can toast your, um, what's that called when you put a cheese on a toast? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's delicious is all I know. I'm, I'm blanking. Anyway, anyway. all right. So uh, planaria, why were we talking about the magical planaria that they have the mystery of life? Yeah. So, so the reason we're talking about planaria is not only are they immortal, okay? Not only do they regenerate every part of the body, uh, they, do, they generally don't get cancer, right? So which we can talk about why that's important. They're smart. They can learn things. So you can train them. And it turns out that if you train a planarian and then cut their heads off, the tail will regenerate a brand new brain that still remembers the original information. Do they have a biological network going on or yes, no? Yes, yes. So their somatic cells yeah. are forming a network and that's that's what you mean by a true brain? Well, what's the requirement for a true brain? Uh, I, like everything else, it's a continuum, but, yes. but, but a true brain has certain characteristics as far as the density, like a localized density of neurons that guides behavior. Oh, in so the head. Exactly. Connected if, to the exactly. head. Exactly. If you cut their head off, uh, the, the tail doesn't have, that doesn't do anything. It just sits there until the new brain is, 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 you know, until a new brain regenerates. They have all the same neurotransmitters that you and I have, but here's why, here's why we're talking about them in, in this, in this context. So here's your planaria. You cut off the head, you cut off the tail, you have a middle fragment. That middle fragment has to make one head and one tail. How does it know how many of each to make and where do they go? How come it doesn't switch? How come, right? So 
So we did a very simple uh, thing and we said, okay, let's, let's make the hypothesis that there's a somatic electrical network that remembers the correct pattern. And then what it's doing is, is recalling that memory and building to that pattern. So what we did was we used a, um, a way to visualize electrical activity in these cells, right? It's a, it's a, it's a variant of what people use to look for electricity in the brain. And we saw that it has a, that that fragment has a very, very particular, um, electrical pattern. You can literally see it once, once we developed the technique, it has a very particular electrical pattern that shows you where the head and the tail goes, right? You can, you can just see it. And then we said, okay, well, now let's test the idea that that's a memory that actually controls where the head and the tail goes. Let's change that pattern. So basically incept a false memory. And so what you can do is you can do that in many different ways. One way is with um, drugs that target ion channels to say, and, and so you, you pick these drugs and you say, okay, I'm going to do it so that instead of, so that instead of this one head, one tail pa electrical pattern, you have a two headed pattern, right? You're just editing the electrical information in the, in the network. When you do that, guess what the cells build? They build a two headed worm. And the coolest thing about it now, no, no genetic changes. So we haven't touched the genome. The genome is totally wild type, but the amazing thing about it is that when you take these two headed animals and you cut them into pieces again, some of those pieces will continue to make two headed animals. So, so that information, that, that memory, that, that electrical circuit, not only does it hold the information for how many heads, not only does it use that information to tell the cells what to do to regenerate, but it stores it. Once you've reset it, it keeps, and we can go back. We can take a two headed animal and, and put it back to one headed. So now imagine, so there's a couple of interesting things here that, um, that have implications for understanding what, what genomes and things like that. Imagine I take this two headed animal, um, Oh, and by the way, when they reproduce, when they tear themselves in half, you still get two-headed animals. So imagine I take them and I throw them in the Charles River over here. So 100 years later, some scientists come along and they scoop up some samples and they go, oh, here's a single-headed form and a two-headed form. Wow, a speciation event. Cool. Let's sequence the genome and see why what happened. The genomes are identical. There's nothing wrong with the genome. So if you ask the question, how does... So, so this goes back to your very first question is where do body plants come from, right? How does the planarian know how many heads it's supposed to have? Now... It's interesting because you could say DNA, but what happened, what, what, as it turns out, the DNA pr produces a piece of hardware that by default says one head. The way that when you turn on a calculator, by default, it's a zero every single time, right? When you turn it on, it just says zero. But it's a programmable calculator as it turns out. So once you've changed that, next time it won't say zero, it'll say something else. And the same thing here. So you can make, you can make one headed, two headed, you can make no headed worms. We've done some other things along these lines, some other really weird um, constructs. So, so this, 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 this question of, right. So again, it's really important. The, the, the hardware software distinction is really important because the hardware is essential because without proper hardware, you're never going to get to the right physiology of having that memory. But once you have it, it doesn't fully determine what the information is going to be. You can have other information in there and it's reprogrammable by us, by bacteria, by various parasites, probably, um, things like that. The other amazing thing about these planarias, think about this. Most animals, when we get a mutation in our bodies, our children don't inherit it, right? So you could go on, you could run around for 50, 60 years getting mutations. Your children don't have those mutations because we go through the egg stage. Planaria tear themselves in half and that's how they reproduce. So for 400 million years, they keep every mutation that they've had that doesn't kill the cell that it's in. So when you look at these planaria, their bodies are what's called mixoploid, meaning that every cell might have a different number of chromosomes. They look like a tumor. If you look at the, 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 the genome is an incredible mess because they accumulate all this stuff. And yet the, their body structure is, they are the best regenerators on the planet. Their anatomy is rock solid, even though their genome is, is all kinds of crap. So this is uh, kind of a scandal, right? That, you know, when we learn that, well, you know, what are genomes to what? Genomes determine your body. Okay, why does the animal with the worst genome have the best anatomical control, the most cancer resistant, the most regenerative, right? Really, we're just beginning to start to understand this um, relationship between the, the genomically determined hardware. And, and, and by the way, just as of, as of a couple of months ago, I think I now somewhat understand why this is, but it's really, it's really a major, you know, a major puzzle. I mean, that really throws a wrench into the whole nature versus nurture because you usually associate electricity with the with the nurture and it, the hardware with the nature, and it's, there's just this weird integrated mess yeah, that propagates through generations. Yeah, it's much more fluid. It's much more complex. Um, you can you can imagine what's what's happening here is just just imagine the evolution of a of a of, a, of an animal like this that that multi scale. This goes back to this multi scale competency, right? Imagine that you have two, 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 you have an animal that um, 
that where it's it's tissues have some degree of multi-scale competency so for example if the like like we saw in the tadpole you know if you put an eye on its tail they can still see out of that eye right that the, you know there's all there's incredible plasticity so if you have an animal and it comes up for selection and uh, the fitness is quite good so evolution doesn't know whether the fitness is good because the genome was awesome or because the genome was kind of junky, but but the competency made up for it, right? And things kind of ended up good. So what that means is that the more competency you have, the harder it is for selection to pick the best genomes. It hides information, right? And so that means that uh, so so what happens? You know, evolution uh, starts basically starts all the start all the hard work is being done to increase the competency. Mm -hmm. because it's harder and harder to see the genomes. And so I think in planaria, what happened is that there's this runaway phenomenon where all the effort went into the algorithm such that we know you got a crappy genome. We can't keep, we can't clean up the genome. We can't keep track of it. So what, what, what's going to happen is what survives are the algorithms that can create a great worm, no matter what the genome is. So everything went into the algorithm and which, which of course then reduces the pressure on keeping a, you know, keeping a clean genome. So this idea of right and and, to, and different animals have this in different to different levels, but this idea of of putting energy into an algorithm that does not overtrain on priors, right? It, it can't assume. I mean, I think biology is this way in general. Evolution doesn't take the past too seriously because it makes these basically problem solving machines as opposed to like exactly what you know to 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 deal with exactly what happened last time. Yeah, problem solving versus memory recall. Mm -hmm. So little memory. But a lot of problem solving. I think so. Yeah, in many cases, yeah. Problem solving. Yep. I mean, it's incredible that those kinds of systems are able to be constructed, um, especially how much they contrast with the way we build problem solving systems in the AI world.